Hello, and welcome to Project Zion. Today is the sixth podcast in a new international series, Grounds for Peace, under the auspices of peaceprojects.eu. I'm one of your co-hosts, Andrew Bolton, joining you from Leicester, England, and a member of the Community of Christ European Peace and Justice team. I'm James Aldridge, you're the co-host, and I'm joining you from London, UK. I teach history and politics in an 11 to 18 state school. I grew up in the community of Christ. My mum is a congregational pastor in Leicester uh, still today. Today we're looking at Christian anarchism. A part of our exploration will include how Christian anarchism can illuminate the early days of Latter-day Saintism. In the founding saga of Latter-day Saintism, we have a second New Testament. Jesus teaches a version of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel in all its radicality. Jesus also heals, blesses the children, and teaches. How do the people respond? Conversion, the love of God in each person's heart, all things in common, no war, no violence, and no government for 200 years. We're also going to explore how Christian anarchist perspectives might help the church in its Peace Zion mission today. With us today is an expert on Christian anarchism, Alexander Christoyadopoulos. He has a Greek dad and a French mum who are both European Union civil servants and he met in Brussels. He's lived in the UK for over two decades. He speaks Greek, French, some Spanish and Portuguese and English. He's humble about his English, but actually he writes beautiful English. He's dad to two little children and his wife is French. His PhD was on Christian anarchism and he loves Tolstoy. Last year, he published a book on Tolstoy's work. He teaches politics and international relations at Loughborough University, just a few miles away from where Andrew and also my mum live. His favourite food, everything his Greek grandmother used to cook. Welcome, Alex. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for the generous introduction. So what is anarchism? There's often a negative uh, history, negative connotations around the word anarchism, and even the word itself can be a bit dramatic and scary. Is there another word or phrase we can use instead? There are other words, but... Anarchism is also a word that signifies a particular uh, tradition of thought and a political ideology, and it's, I think, worth using as well as, yes, there are alternatives. You can say libertarian, for example. Uh, libertarian works uh, in France. Libertaire, for example, is, is often used in, instead of anarchism or can, can be. Whereas in the U.S., the word libertarian is more associated with the right wing, so yeah. what some people call right wing anarchism or free market fundamentalism. It's worth saying that a lot of anarchists in general, and certainly in Europe, uh, reject the very notion of uh, right-wing anarchism. The word is associated with bomb throwing and violence because in the late 19th century, some anarchists, and it was just a minority, did use the dynamite and plant bombs and kill a few people. I mean, one estimate is that in total, in the whole wave of anarchist terrorism, maybe about 300 people died, I think it is, rather than just were victims, which, you know, puts it in proportion against, you know, um, a lot of the terrorism of today. But that period in anarchism's history, uh, that period where some anarchists engaged in terrorism has now stayed. And the stereotype of anarchists slash terrorists, the kind of correspondence between the two, has remained, at least in some of the popular imagination and, and in some of the media. And it's used and abused, but it, it doesn't represent the tradition of political thought or activism that anarchism really stands for. So some anarchists have sort of dabbled in more violent tactics. The vast majority have not. So there's a huge tradition of anarcho-pacifism within anarchism. I don't know about huge, but significant anarchists are anarchists because they are pacifists, for example. And certainly most anarchists today prefer, at least where possible, uh, non-violent activism. And certainly if you, you know, if you refuse to, for example, label violence or the same type of violence, kind of violence against property, so if violence against property, so smashing a window, isn't necessarily violence, then there aren't many anarchists who are violent at all. I, I hope that's a complicated or controversial kind of implicit statement to make in passing. But so there are other words, but the thing is that word does signify a particular you know, tradition, a particular set, a, a position, a multifaceted one with a rich history. And therefore, that's why I, I don't want to shy away from using it. I'd rather try and restore it, uh, reclaim it and you know, reinvest it with actually its true meaning and its potential meaning rather than shy away from it, though I accept that you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky one and 
sometimes it, it, it has negative connotations. It's interesting that you mentioned the non-violence thing, which I guess links to the next question I was going to ask, which is what is Christian anarchism? Is it the non-violence that defines Christian anarchism? Is there other other kind of key components of it? I think it is from many of the Christian anarchists I read for the PhD anyway. So, so what defines Christian anarchism is that it's an anarchism rooted in Christianity, really broadly speaking. So what the anarchism is might mean slightly different things from one person to the other. And the Christianity that we're talking about might mean different things. Um, a lot of Christian anarchists are kind of quite heavily rooted in exegesis, so it's in the text and in the interpretation of the text, the New Testament, Sermon on the Mount in particular. Others uh, elaborate their anarchism from a kind of broader theological position, uh, but and, and their anarchism might be focused on a critique of the state or and or a critique of idolatry and or a critique of economic injustice. There's an element of anti-clericalism in a lot of uh, uh, Christian anarchism. We might come back to that later. But I suppose the one thing that demarcated is, from other forms of anarchism is that its source is in some way a uh, revelation, whether they call that revelation or not. That said, there's immediately an exception and the big one, and it's Tolstoy, who, you know, though he uh, takes his cue from Jesus' teaching, he only takes it because he thinks Jesus' teaching is rational. And so he doesn't take it because of its revealed nature, as it were. So you have that as well. Um, but yes, Tolstoy and many other Christian anarchists are anarchists in huge part because they are pacifists and they reject the violence of the state. They reject its legitimacy. So in terms of Christian anarchism, would you say Jesus is a Christian anarchist? Because there, is a, there are a lot of sort of rejection of, I guess, like the societal structures of the time that kind of, there, there are parallels there, I guess, aren't there? Yes. So... When I did the PhD, it, it was fair to say I didn't want to actually get into that particular thorny question because, in a sense, it's anachronistic because the label anarchism is only really coined uh, a century and a half ago. It didn't, it didn't exist at the time of Jesus, but I did, you know, I don't know if I made the argument in the PhD, I just brought together the arguments that had been published that basically uh, argued, uh, made the claim that Jesus' teaching amounts to, should amount to, a form of anarchism today at the very least. But that said, since then, uh, Justin Meggett has published uh, a very interesting and rigorous chapter in a, in a, in a collection I've co-edited with uh, Matthew Adams. Uh, and so, and I think it's called, Was the Historical Jesus an Anarchist? And he makes a pretty rigorous case that he is or was or should be called one, although he goes through all the caveats along the way. So that's the place to look. It's open access, by the way, so it's freely available uh, on the internet. So yes, there, there is a convincing, I think, argument out there that Jesus could be called an anarchist, quite apart from his teachings implying a form of anarchism today. I guess you mentioned the, the, the sort of modern uh, nature of the term anarchism. So what modern communities, Christian anarchist communities, uh, are there or, or, or have there been and, and how kind of successful have they been? You're not talking about a huge movement with uh, massive presence, uh, but you do have, it depends where you, de where you define modernity. I think it, you mean today. Today, perhaps the most vibrant example of a Christian anarchist set, set of communities is really the Catholic worker movement and the 200 or so houses of hospitality and, and, and similar communities, mostly in the States, but not only, that are, you know, uh, kicking along today, um, often quite small in size, but having an impact uh, locally and comforting the afflicting, the afflicted and the afflicting the comfortable is one of their statements. Uh, you have had Tolstoyans, although there's fewer now than there were in Tolstoy's years. It's worth mentioning, I suppose, Dave Andrews and his work and 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 his fellows, I suppose, or fellow Christians in in Brisbane in Australia. There's a, a network of people. He's not the only one, but the, the Waiters Union is an organisation he talks of. So there's a, there are, and then in, and then if you start loosening your boundaries, you'll find lots of communities that try to live by at least a lot of the uh, ethical teachings that. For Christian anarchists are, you know, essential and, and essential from Jesus' teaching. So they might not apply the full array, as it were, but they still borrow from a lot of them. That's in terms of modern examples, I suppose. Some of them. I guess you sort of answered this a little bit. What can we learn from those communities that tried to, to kind of model their life on those kind of uh, guidelines? 
In a sense, I I don't know if I'm the best place to answer that because you know you'd have to ask the people who who live in those and you know to, to get I suppose a more authentic answer. But uh, my take is that you learn that life in intentional communities is not easy, but it's possible, and you don't even have to sort of fully subscribe to the intentional community model. You can just be part of a community, but still go back to a place that is kind of your home where you have a, a, you know a separate life as well. So some people are close to communities but not necessarily in it um, in them as in residential as it were I guess one of the things you learn quite quickly so if you look at Tolstoy for example a lot of these communities basically crashed quite quickly because they weren't very practically minded or pragmatically minded partly because Tolstoy's teaching is you know more on the principles than on the practicalities of alternative life living if that's a word kind of intentionally vague yes he didn't. He just didn't really focus on that. For him, the priority was, I think, denouncing violence at the time and speaking at the level at which he spoke. And interesting though that was, that didn't necessarily help those who were moved by his writings and decided to drop everything and set off into a, a new community. So, you know, those kinds of people will have learned that you need to be practical as well as utopian. You may not change the world. You may not even succeed as a community, but you learn from that experience and you can apply those uh, lessons to the next social struggle or application of your of of your ethics to politics, and so yes, another lesson I suppose we can learn. Last one is that individual communities may not change the world, but they can still try and live according to their principles, and that in turn may inspire others either then or later on. And yes, it might be that those communities often have remained marginal and haven't had the kind of impact that I suppose Gandhi had or some of the big names or, or groups of people who've changed the world. But nonetheless, they exist. They are there. They have, they have shown that certain things are possible. They have learned from the things that aren't. They have lessons to share. There's, there's plenty to learn, actually, uh, if you care to look at it. But it, it, it's, it's not something I've researched in huge, in huge depth, but there's plenty to look at. So, Alex, what got you hooked on Christian anarchism and Tolstoy in particular? It's an interesting question because I'm asked that often these days and I'm not sure of the exact chronology and the exact events. But once I got to Tolstoy and started reading, I think the first thing I read was The Kingdom of God is Within You. I quickly did get hooked because of the eloquence and the unflinching nature, I suppose, of his critique of violence, including state violence, the refusing to shy away from the full implications of his rejection of violence, that is the implication of it for structures that we have otherwise come to see as legitimate. So it's through Tolstoy that I got hooked on Christian anarchism. And it's probably fair to say that I've remained hooked on Tolstoy in particular. Uh, I, I did the work I did on Christian anarchism. I am still very interested in it, but Tolstoy I, I like in particular. What at the time of basically what was the PhD got me hooked on to Christian anarchism more generally was a desire to explore whether Tolstoy's position actually did make exegetical sense. Because you see, Tolstoy has a lot of things to say based on the Sermon on the Mount and forgiveness, not judging. I mean, lots of passages in the New Testament and in the gospel in particular. But for example, he will ignore Paul. He distrusts Paul entirely. He says very little about render unto Caesar. He doesn't tackle some of the passages that it is fair to ask of a Christian anarchist to have an answer to anyway. And so I was interested in what Tolstoy had to say, but I thought his case was, you know, if there were gaps. And then I quickly realized that there are others who have basically spoken in those gaps. So you have Jacques Ellul, Werner Deller, Dave Andrews, and quite a few other writers anyway, to focus on people I could study for the PhD, who have said things that when you then pull them all together, alongside Tolstoy, constitute what I think is a pretty coherent argument according to which Christianity should amount ethically, or the moral teachings of Christianity, translate politically into a form of anarchism. And so I, I was interested in Tolstoy, but it was partly my frustration at his sort of ignoring certain passages that I thought it was important to tackle that then got me interested in Christian anarchism more generally. So very interesting. So your PhD supervisor was on an interesting journey with you, I bet. <laughs> yeah, they have said that. So Tolstoy is very interesting, I agree. Perhaps the greatest novelist of all time, with War and Peace and Anna Karenna. He was an aristocrat very privileged, a soldier, 
a womanizer, and then he underwent a serious Christian conversion and changed in some very significant ways. Can you tell us something about that conversion, please? It also changed what he wrote after that, right? Yes. So Tolstoy is generally aware of his sense of privilege, slightly feeling guilty, but also quite happy to enjoy those. He does go to the army. He starts writing when he's in Crimea. It's, it has a pretty immediate and significant effect. He goes on to marry. He writes War and Peace in you know seven-ish years of fairly happy family life. That is, to be clear, life where his wife did a lot of the family work and he just wrote War and Peace and enjoyed uh, life in his uh, aristocratic estate, Yasnia Poliana, uh, near Tula. But the doubts come back, the niggles come back, the sense of guilt come back. And as he's writing Anna Karenina in the 1870s, he goes through an intensifying period of existential torment. He's not sure about the meaning of life. He eventually writes about that once he's, once he's through um, in A Confession, which is you know, one of his books. Uh, and in it, he, according to his biographers, slightly over-exaggerates the extent to which there really is a break, but he certainly talks of a break. So, and he says he's tormented, he looks for the answer to the meaning of life everywhere and finds it nowhere. The meaning of life for him, the question for him is, is, is phrased this way. It's what's the point of living if at the end of it, death is to follow. And he doesn't really actually answer that particular question fully once he does find the answer. What he does say is that he finds the answer or the moment, that his eureka moment is once he reads once again, because he'd read it before, but at that point the coin drops, uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and in particular the counsel to turn the other cheek. And at that point, or well, from then on, from that, from reading that, it seems to trigger in him a whole set of reflections about violence and the pain of violence, the, the, a meaning to be found in trying to reduce, uh, eliminate the, the violence that there is around him. And in short, from that pacifism in a sense, and, and then from it a, a, a relentless anarchism or a rejection of the state because it's violent too, from that position, develops a, a kind of new Tolstoy for the next 30 years of his life, 1879-ish, which is when he kind of, kind of converts to uh, him passing away in 1910. He, he's just a relentless, let's call him a Christian anarchist, who just keeps contributing in various forms, various lengths to different sort of outlets at the time. You know, he, he, he writes letters, he writes essays, he writes books, he writes a lot trying to convert people, I suppose, to his position. Now, it's worth saying that although he converts to Christianity, it's a very rationalistic version of Christianity. He filters all dogmas, all scriptures through the light of reason. If it's not rational, he just dumps it. He disregards it. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't fit his model. And so he's an awkward Christian at the very least. He doesn't subscribe to the resurrection. He doesn't buy the miracles. He thinks a lot of these things are added later on to distract people from what he thinks is the most important, which is Jesus' ethics, the radical morality preached by Jesus, which he happens to agree with, not because Jesus, the son of God or whatever said it, but because Jesus, a very you know perceptive and clever man, I suppose, as far as Tolstoy is concerned, uh, said it best. And so from then on, his focus is the Sermon on the Mount and the implication of it for uh, society. And yes, therefore, he writes differently. He writes much less fiction. He writes a lot. Uh, as I said, he has huge correspondence for a while. He keeps writing his diaries. More to the point, he writes lots of essays and various interventions. But he does write some fiction. And perhaps the most notorious one is Resurrection, which is his third biggest novel after War and Peace and Anna Karenina. It's actually not really fully completed. He's not completely satisfied with it. By the time he publishes it, he publishes it because it'll help fund the migration of the Duchobors, which is a group of sectarians in Russia that he comes to sympathize with, their migration to Canada. Um, so it's going to fund that, and so that's why he publishes it. So he still publishes some fiction. Uh, Haji Murat would be another one, Father Sergius, I think. Quite a few other shorter pieces, but his focus is more on, uh, I suppose, the essays, the political and the economic commentary. So I want to come back to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I read what I believe. He takes chapter five of the Sermon on the Mount. That's the bit he really focuses on. He finds or discovers five commandments of Jesus there. 
no name calling, no anger, faithfulness in marriage, no oath taking, no retaliation and love of enemies. And what I find so interesting is that Tolstoy, the master of language and all its subtleties, said the words of Jesus here should be read and understood in their plain and literal sense. I'm also impressed at his ability to do exegesis, to do work through the Greek texts and biblical commentaries to find the rigorous meaning of Jesus's words. So you've said something already about Tolstoy and the Sermon on the Mount, but this is the central piece, and he takes it in a literal, plain words of Jesus sense, even though he's a novelist with uh, great skills in the use of language. So that's a testimony in some ways, I think, of the Sermon on the Mount through Tolstoy. Yes. I think the thing about also once he's onto something, he's like an expression I've come to like, like a dog with a bone. He won't let go. He will just push it as far as, it, you know, for as long as he has to, uh, uh, whatever people think. So it is through rigorous research that he does come to that view. You could argue, some people have argued, they may have a point, at least up to a point, uh, that He's a little bit selective at times. He's a little bit uh, tactical in ignoring certain things. But nevertheless, you know, he learned ancient Greek for the purpose. He tried to, you know, to go back to text, understand it as fully as possible, admittedly to probably fit an understanding that he had decided that he wanted to be the only one without any nuancing. Nevertheless, he does research it quite rigorously. And so in the process, it allows him to dispute orthodox exegesis, uh, dogmatic theology. I mean, what I believe is, is I think I'm right in remembering, is one in one of four parts. It's supposed to be read, I think it's the third part after the critique of dogmatic theology. Uh, there's another bit, and there's the gospel. There's that. He actually translates and harmonizes the gospel. He thinks, what's you know, this nonsense of having four different versions that don't fully concur? Let's just have one version that's coherent and harmonized. He actually does that. He translates and harmonizes the gospel. So you know, he's certainly unflinching and he won't let go. And, 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 and yes, it, he is quite rigorous. And I think even if one might argue with some legitimacy that he's ignoring certain things that shouldn't necessarily be that quickly dismissed when it comes to, say, um, theology, certain dogma, etc. Nevertheless, in his relentless analysis of what is nevertheless there, which people tend to sort of look away from because it's very demanding, he's very rigorous. And it's not just not name-calling, by the way, it's no anger as far as Tolstoy is concerned. To reduce it to name-calling is one of the things he takes issue with traditional interpretation uh, on. It's not judging one another, forgiving 70 times, 77 times to, to be the salt and the light. Uh, he, he interprets as well the, uh, Jesus' third temptation in, in the desert. Uh, Satan apparently has all the kingdoms of the world to offer to Jesus. Jesus doesn't dispute that, but he says, go, you know, go away, Satan, because my, my kingdom is not, I think, of, of, of this kind or of this world. I can't remember the exact passage now. The temple cleansing, Jesus' arrest, trial and crucifixion, uh, you know, all these passages, Tolstoy, along with Christian anarchists as well, it should be said, for some, some of them better than Tolstoy, you know, is quite relentless on. And, and the point about all that, I suppose, for Tolstoy is that through the state, and not just the state, but through the economic, social, cultural relations that we all contract with one another in, in, in the current political economic order, the state mainly uh, in his era and in Russia, we don't do that to one another. Through the state, we do not do all of this that Jesus asked us to do. And therefore, we should ditch the state. The state is something that makes us do the contrary to what Jesus asks of us. That's why Tolstoy settles on anarchism, because as far as he's concerned, the commandments are simply incompatible. Um, or what the state requires from us, what we do to one another through it, is exactly the contrary to what Jesus asked us to do on at least a number of different things. So I get, I, for me, there's two areas in history that I'm, I'm really interested in. So it's, it's Russia in the early 1900s, and it's Britain after the Second World War. And I think if you, if you kind of think about Tolstoy growing up in, in Tsarist Russia, it's, it's kind of no surprise that he is opposed to the state because it's about as, as bad a state as he can kind of get. And it's kind of also no surprise that he's not the only one. You get 
you know, uh, later on the Bolsheviks, you got, you know, the social revolutionaries backing in all those sorts of other anti-state people that are kind of at the same time. So it's kind of understandable, given the corruption, the inefficiency of the state in, in, in Russia, that he'd be opposed to it. If you, if you transported him to, to Britain in 1945 and asked him his views on Attlee and the Labour government, which I would argue is kind of like big government done well, would he have the same criticisms of the state as a construct then as he would have done in, in Tsarist Russia, do you think? I think he would. Uh, it's, of course, purely speculative, and that's an important caveat. I don't know. You know. He didn't live there. We're only speculating. But it's, I think, pretty clear from what he says about not just Russia, but Britain at the time and uh, numerous other I suppose, ways of building the state, that it's not just the, uh, the Tsarist state that he's critical of. The British state is still built on violence. It's still... Um, acquires or claims to have uh, the monopoly over the legitimate use of violence from its population. And he, he wasn't just critical of, of, of Russia. Also, 1945 Britain is still an empire. Uh, and, you know, uh, Tosseseni is critical of that. He's also critical of the um, stratification of society that is basically maintained by that state. So it's nice to have the welfare state. Of course it is. I personally, perhaps, I don't know if I depart from Tosseseni, I certainly have more sympathies than perhaps he would have. Uh, but nevertheless, it still requires violence, um, not just at its fringes, but at its very base. And for Tolstoy, more to the point, change, if it's going to be lasting, must come not from the top down, but from within outwards. And that's not what happens with even a reformist uh, government uh, in, in 1945 Britain. Am I right in thinking that Christian anarchism is, is much more, uh, is much less about kind of the route to uh, gaining power, which some anarchists do speak of a little bit, and is much more about kind of localism, recreating society at a kind of a communal level. It's non-violent, it's about grassroots, it's about community, and kind of the idea that people have, have to take responsibility for themselves and other people, and it's always a journey. That's right. That's how I understand it. And, and that's actually, uh, by and large, w- what a lot of anarchism is about without the Christian root- rooting for it. But yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of the end point as opposed to the process, right? Ah, now that's an interesting question because uh, for, I mean, fundamental to anarchism, secular and religious, I think, is the importance of process, the refusal to compromise in the process, the idea that to get to that end point, we need to enact the kind of endpoint that we envisage in the process of yeah. trying to get there so prefiguration in one word that's critical uh, it's it's the one it's it's perhaps the most important thing that differentiates anarchists from other left-wing currents that is particularly strong among anarchists yes so tolstoy is also very critical of the russian orthodox church which supported the state monarchy supported the judiciary, including capital punishment, and also the military, much like the Church of England in British history. And his criticism, again, was based on the Sermon on the Mount, um, that the Orthodox Church was not living up to this or obscured it or taught against it, in fact. So can you tell us something about Tolstoy's relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church? He was an anarchist about institutional religion, right? Not just the state or government. He was anti-clerical. Oh, that's one word anyway. But yes, he was very critical of the church hierarchy. For him, the best illustration of what has gone wrong with the church, not necessarily the the moment that it happened, but the epitome of it, and after that, it's kind of essentially corrupt, uh, is Constantine's conversion to Christianity. For him, that's not Constantine converting to Christianity. It's it's Christianity being adapted to the empire and therefore losing its, its its authenticity. So he's acerbically critical about the church as an institution, yes, but he does appeal directly to the clergy. There's a one famous piece he's written is, is titled Appeal to the Clergy. So and that's how that's how it's been titled anyway in its in its translation. So you know he will try and address the people behind those structures, uh, at least it, not necessarily the bishops and archbishops, but certainly the, the more common clergy, I suppose. But he's very critical of the church. And that's one of the reasons why he gets excommunicated in 1901. I mean, for the, for the story, the reason that that's finally triggered in 1901 is it's the publication of Resurrection, that third novel I mentioned before, because in it, two chapters of it are kind of brutally ridiculing the Eucharist uh, through a literary device uh, attributed to Tolstoy um, 
called defamiliarization. The, the, the censorship at the time reduces the whole two chapters to uh, two words or three. The service began. The rest is edited out. The church doesn't like that and uses the publication of that book as the trigger to excommunicate him. Interestingly, when he's on his deathbed on a remote train station um, for about a week, and it's kind of a big media event, lots of people become aware of it. Uh, the church dispatches clergy to try and readmit a repentant Tolstoy on his deathbed, but was refused entry. So he's against a form of religion that suffocates the way of Jesus. That's why he's critical of uh, the Orthodox Church. So let's bring Christian anarchy to today. Uh, it denounces all forms of hierarchy, oppression, domination. So what would Tolstoy have to say about some of the issues that are hot topics today, like hostility to immigrants and refugees, LGBT inclusion or exclusion, racism, caste, gender equality? Can you speculate? In a, you're not supposed to do this as a historian, but can you join us in speculating about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can certainly try and try and remain uh, um, respectful or authentic to Tolstoy's views. So, yeah, the thing is here, it does get a little bit complicated. So, yes, he would probably, the easy bit, he would probably oppose borders and hence any hostility to migrants. He would oppose racism, uh, caste, uh, you know, economic stratification and so on. And that, I think it's fairly safe to say he would, you know, he would side with those um, movements, I suppose, or th those moves anyway, yes. He's a lot trickier on gender because his views on marriage, sex, and feminism are much less comfortable for what you might call, I suppose, progressives or uh, radicals, um, you know, people on the left, I guess, today. And that's for a range of uh, a complicated reasons. So very briefly on marriage, he considers formal sanction of uh, marriage by the church irrelevant that is for him the first union should be the only one it's not a, it's not unnecessary for the church to sanction it that first union should be the only one the rest is lust um, you know that union is mainly to procreate he does have a particular expectation of a division of roles i mean women will mostly um, not just give birth but uh, take care of the education of children etc and later on, that evolves to become even more kind of ascetic to kind of a position of advocating complete abstinence because he's worried that any sexual intercourse risks awakening the senses and lust and the kind of passions he wants to sort of not awake. So for an, a range of mostly, you'd say, probably reactionary reasons, he's he's got a pretty awkward position on, on marriage and sex. Now... Of course, some of his biographers have pointed out this is quite hypocritical because he was himself quite sexually active, certainly up until he becomes a proponent of abstinence. And so, and, and yeah, there perhaps is an element of a hypocrisy, maybe an element of him having been ridden with guilt throughout uh, and, 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 and kind of resolving it by that extreme position. As for feminism, he is aware of the very early way, the first wave of feminism when he's writing. I mean, the more, the more recent waves, of course, uh, emerge after he's passed away. But for him, the feminists of the time are misled because, because their priority isn't the, the important priority today. So he agrees, as it were, that all human beings are of equal worth and should be treated accordingly. But feminism for him focuses on the wrong priority, which should be uh, you know about violence and 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 basically all he tends to bang on about rather than uh, what feminism first wave feminism was about. So on those issues, I don't think he'd be you know on the side of typical progressives or or, or on the left today. On the rest that you mentioned, yes. On the, on another of the key hot topics, veganism. So Tolstoy, who is a pioneering vegetarian, he was for peace and justice and compassion on our plates. Do you think he'd be a vegan today? Possibly. Again, it's pure speculation, but I'm not sure because his primary reasons for being vegetarian were two. One, it was kind of his asceticism or his worry that eating meat, again, awakens the senses and that's a slippery slope that leads to violence. So he's worried about that. And as long as you don't eat the meat, then you don't do that, I suppose. So you don't need to be a vegan. Vegetarianism suffices on that one. And the other reason, the other important reason is because of the violence inflicted against animals that are going to be killed so that you can eat them. And again, 
you know, as long as you don't eat the animals, he's not going to be as bothered, I suppose. Now, he possibly might have sympathies with broader vegan arguments around the exploitation of animals, but that's not something he develops at the time. So perhaps, but I think vegetarianism probably is, is, is where he's at. I mean, that's, what he's, that's where he left us anyway. You said the Catholic workers are an example of Christian anarchism. In your book on Christian anarchism, you, you mentioned also the Anabaptists, the Hutterites, and so on. I want to look at early Latter-day Saintism as another kind of example. It begins in the 1830s with the Book of Mormon. And in this Book of Mormon, there's a, a central apex story of a golden age. It's found in what I would call the New Testament of the Book of Mormon. And here, Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount, a very Christian anarchist thing to do. He heals, he movingly blesses the children, and people respond by conversion and living out a form of Christian anarchism that's not sure. It lasts 200 years. And might it be profitable, even worthwhile, for Latter-day Saints to re-explore their early Christian anarchism today, particularly given that the LDS church is very hierarchical and sometimes an unjust institution, but with some wonderful people in it. And Community of Christ, another branch of the Latter-day Saint movement, does not take seriously this early Latter-day Saint anarchist phase, but its current peace journey might encourage us to take a second look at our beginnings. So do you have any wisdom or advice on Latter-day Saints possibly reclaiming their earlier Christian anarchist past? So that's a good question, but I'm afraid uh, with the fear of possibly disappointing, it's in a sense not really for me to say, and that's for two reasons. One is you know, I'm not in the tradition and I don't know that much about it. Um, um, I suppose the thing that a lot of Christian anarchists do, which maybe you know, would be for Latter-day Saints to consider, would, you know, would be to ask yourself, whether your religious practice genuinely honors the authentic calling or have you compromised? Do you look away from the more difficult bits? Do you try and explain away the bits that you don't really want to live up to because it's, it involves too many sacrifices? The, the critique that's implicit in that applies here, but that would be, I suppose, the question to ask. Look back at the origins, the original uh, intentions. How closely are you really honoring them, I suppose? That, that would be the Christian anarchist kind of line of inquisition. I I suppose. Inquisition's an unfortunate word, like line of inquiry. I think lots of us have wondered, given the t- kind of times that we live in, whether, you know, some sort of overhaul of society might be, might be, uh, might be about time. So I just wonder what you thought about how Christianism might work in practice in 2020. So whether, you know, on a localised scale, on a wider scale, what elements could be woven into society, even if we don't go whole hog, so to speak? It isn't just to be imagined. There are examples that are ongoing. It, it, it's local, but interconnected uh, with transnational issues where relevant. The ecological catastrophe, for one, um, caring for migrants, etc., who are you know, brushed aside by the system is another. So it would be local, interconnected, caring. It would visibly reject violence and idolatry. It would be critical of capitalism. It would prioritize caring for the afflicted. It would be a thorn on the church's side, certainly more institutionalized churches. And it would be allied with nonviolent dissidents on the causes of common concern. And, and, and in all of this, it's fair to say, it would be quite similar to the vast majority of anarchists, just not necessarily coming from the, the same very first step, as it were, uh, the, the origin, the root, but nevertheless finding common purpose, common action, common activity, common life, common community uh, along the way. So if you were to recommend one book written by Tolstoy as a beginning, what book would you recommend? I have a a whole paragraph, and not the shortest one, in my book at the end, listing the different books you might want to dip into depending on what you're most interested in. So it, it does get tricky, but okay, the most famous one is The Kingdom of God is Within You, of course, and it is a good read. It, it goes on a bit, but it's still it's still it, it, interesting throughout. What I believe, which you mentioned before, I long thought was better, simply 
as an exegesis. So if you're into exegesis, what I believe is probably more rigorous than the kingdom of God is within you. But you've also got, because Tolstoy has written so many shorter pieces, three things I'm supposed to mention. One is, so two are edited collections. One certainly is still edited today, I think. So it's, it's Government is Violence by David Stevens. It's a collection of essays by Tolstoy on a range of issues. There's also a book called Tolstoy's Writings on Civil Disobedience and Peace, which is uh, also another, another collection uh, of interest. And then on nonresistance.org, there are lots of pieces uh, by Tolstoy published freely available uh, for, for people to dip into should they wish to. Could I ask you to recommend a good biography on Tolstoy? I really like Rosamond Bartlett's, uh, I think it's Tolstoy, A Russian Life. It's, it, and I like it because it doesn't ignore, but it actually addresses and weaves throughout the biography Tolstoy's more political and religious views, and it does, and it treats them fairly, uh, as opposed to some of his biographers. So that's the one I would go for. Thank you. So we're asking all our guests this key question for peaceprojects.eu. Alex, what would you do for peace personally? In very brief, I would listen to the cries of injustice first. Uh, I gave you a slightly longer answer the other day. I, I, I think a, a peace that is not just is not a sustainable peace, and it's not necessarily a peace that I would want to campaign for. Now, first, therefore, we need to look at questions of injustice. And once that's addressed, and as part of it, we, of course, think about peace, then we might be able to get to peace. So I, that's perhaps my cop-out answer, but I think an important one, nevertheless. Thank you, Alexandra Krishnanopoulos, for joining us in this podcast in a series, Grounds for Peace. You've been incredibly generous in doing both a webinar and now a podcast with us. And I want to recommend two of your books to our listeners as very good reads. Your book on Christian anarchism, a political commentary on the gospel. And I think we would recommend the abridged edition for the ordinary reader, 2011. And it's not expensive. And then your book, Tolstoy's Political Thought, Christian Anarcho-Pacifist Iconoclasm, Then and Now, which is more expensive, uh, but that came out just last year, I think. Uh, I'll say just briefly on that one. I'm sorry. The pricing is nothing to do with me. It's, a, it's an academic publisher, so they price them for academic libraries, although the, the understanding has all along been that after about 18 months, so this would be in about six to eight months, a paperback would be made available at a much more reasonable price. At the moment, it's just exorbitant. Oh, that's good news. So hang on for the paperback, the Tolstoy book. So this is Project Zion, and today James Aldridge and Andrew Bolton uh, from England have been your hosts. Thank you for joining us. May I, in closing, ask you, our audience, our listeners, to consider this question too. What would you do for peace? Mm -hmm.